Hello, this is Eric Strong again from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. This is the ninth lecture in the series on mechanical ventilation, and today's topic is lung protective ventilation. The learning objectives of this lecture are as follows. First, to be familiar with the general types of ventilator-associated lung injury. Next, to understand the basic principles of and protocol for lung protective ventilation. To be familiar with the consequences of and contraindications for permissive hypercapnia. And finally, to be familiar with the term open lung ventilation. Ventilator-associated lung injury can occur in virtually any lung disease, but most frequently complicates acute lung injury and ARDS, or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Four basic forms of ventilator-associated lung injury have been described. First is barotrauma, which is a collection of pathologic processes caused by excessively high airway pressures and which is the most obviously recognizable class of injury. The second class of injury is known as volutrauma, in which damage to the lung occurs as a consequence of excessive tidal volumes and not from excessive airway pressures. Next is a phenomenon known as biotrauma, and finally is cyclic atelectasis, which is occasionally referred to as atelectrauma, which refers to injury occurring as a consequence of alveoli continuously collapsing and re-expanding over and over again. Some authorities do not include biotrauma under the heading of ventilator-associated lung injury, although I personally find this distinction to be kind of semantic and which may not even make sense as barotrauma and volutrauma may actually be manifestations of the same pathologic phenomenon. A somewhat distinct form of ventilator-associated lung injury is oxygen toxicity. Uh, this is when excessive levels of oxygen can lead to a variety of pathologic processes in the lungs. However, these are generally not clinically significant until the fraction of inspired oxygen exceeds 60%, which is rarely necessary. The one notable exception is in patients who are concurrently treated with the chemotherapeutic bleomycin used in the treatment of cancers such as Hodgkin's lymphoma. Pulmonary oxygen toxicity may develop at much lower levels of oxygen in this circumstance. I won't discuss oxygen toxicity in any more detail here, uh, but this may be a subject of a future lecture. The most common manifestation of barotrauma is a pneumothorax where gas leaking from a ruptured alveolus enters the pleural space, where it can hinder ventilation. In severe cases, known as a tension pneumothorax, the increased intrapleural pressure becomes severe enough to impair venous return and can precipitate hypotension and even a PEA arrest. Other less common manifestations of barotrauma include pneumomediastinum and subcutaneous emphysema, uh, both of which I will show images of in a moment. One can also get a systemic gas embolism when the intraalveolar pressure exceeds pulmonary venous pressure. And finally, one can develop cystic lesions in the lung parenchyma as a relatively contained form of barotrauma. Here is an example of a tension pneumothorax on plain x-ray. You can immediately note the hyperlucency and absence of lung markings on the left, along with a rightward shift of the cardiac silhouette trachea, and other mediastinal structures. This patient was likely severely hypotensive. Here is the more subtle pneumomediastinum. If you look very closely, you can see an outline of hyperlucency adjacent to the right mediastinal border. The extension of the hyperlucency being adjacent to both the heart borders is suggestive that this patient has also developed pneumopericardium. These conditions can be surprisingly asymptomatic um, or lead to chest pain. Uh, hypotension can theoretically complicate pneumopericardium, though I have personally never seen this occur. And here is the very dramatic subcutaneous emphysema. Positive pressure through a ruptured alveolus or airway has forced air to dissect out into the subcutaneous tissues. This can usually be readily detected on physical exam by the presence of crepitus when gently pushing down on the affected area. Although I have never specifically read about complications from examining for crepitus, I can't imagine that pushing down on the skin to force the trapped air to further dissect is particularly good for the patient. Uh, 
Thus, I would advise against asking every medical student on the ward to come over to the affected patient and try to elicit crepitus themselves, although uh, this can certainly be te uh, tempting uh, from time to time. The most significant risk factor for the development of viral trauma is high plateau pressure. Some sources quote an excessive risk with pressure above 35 centimeters of water, while others quote a threshold of 30. Other risk factors include high minute ventilation, a non-homogeneous parenchymal disease such as ARDS, necrotizing lung pathology, and secretion retention. Even when alveolar rupture doesn't occur, excessive regional volumes are believed to be damaging to the lung parenchyma even in the absence of excessive airway pressures. The first significant evidence that ventilator-associated lung injury had mechanisms aside from gross barotrauma came in the 1980s when researchers conducted rat experiments in which rats were mechanically ventilated with their chest walls bound. This allowed relatively independent control of tidal volumes and airway pressures. The outcome was seen that the rats with lower tidal volumes and high airway pressures developed less lung injury than those with high tidal volumes, irrespective of their airway pressures. Thus, the conclusion that it was actually the high tidal volumes that were the problem. Some authors have suggested, based on physiology, that what is commonly referred to as viral trauma and as volume trauma are actually manifestations of the same phenomenon. A discussion of this is beyond the scope of this talk, but I would direct the interested listener to examine a review paper by uh, Gattinoni and colleagues in Volume 38 of Critical Care Medicine entitled Ventilator-Induced Lung Injury, the Anatomic and Physiological Framework. The term biotrauma refers to the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines in response to supranormal intraalveolar pressures even in the absence of physical damage to the lung architecture that might be seen with gross barotrauma. The most clinically relevant physiologic consequence is pulmonary and interstitial edema from increased microvascular permeability. However, systemic circulation of pro-inflammatory mediators may contribute to the multi-organ failure that frequently accompanies ARDS. Here is a rather dramatic demonstration of extreme biotrauma. On the left are normal rat lungs. In the middle are rat lungs that have been ventilated at high airway pressures for five minutes, where regional atelectasis has developed. And finally, on the right are rat lungs that have been ventilated at high airway pressures for 20 minutes, where the extreme pulmonary edema is grossly evident. The final class of ventilator-associated lung injury is cyclic atelectasis. This somewhat unconfirmed form of lung injury is thought to be the result of non-uniform cyclic expansion and collapse of alveoli, where shear forces may damage alveoli adjacent to cyclically collapsing ones. In addition, a published theoretical model has also suggested that the intraalveolar pressure during alveolar collapse may increase as much as four times over the measured airway pressures. This has not been experimentally confirmed, however, and the overall importance or even existence of atelic trauma remains a little unclear. As a consequence of these forms of ventilator-associated lung injury, an approach to mechanical ventilation, generally known as lung protective ventilation, has been developed to help prevent it. The principal feature to all lung protective protocols is low tidal volumes. Although you can imagine patients with respiratory failure from most causes would benefit, in practice, it is used almost solely in patients with ARDS, as they are the ones at greatest risk for ventilator-associated injury. The first significant trial showing possible benefit to lung protective ventilation came in 1998, where 53 patients were randomized to either conventional ventilation, in which they were given tidal volumes of 12 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight, and the lowest PEEP that allowed acceptable oxygenation, or protective ventilation, in which they were given tidal volumes of 6 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight, and the PEEP was set to no less than the lower inflection point on the static pressure volume curve. What this amounted to was the conventional group had high tidal volumes and low PEEP, while the pr protective group had low tidal volumes and high PEEP. Here is their most notable finding. As is, is pretty apparent, 
the long protective strategy of low tidal volumes and high peep appears to have conferred significant survival advantage, though interestingly there was not a statistically significant difference in the chance that any particular patient would survive the hospital discharge. Although these discrepant findings initially seemed counterintuitive, it was probably the result of small study size and the fact that the patients enrolled were extremely sick. In addition to the survival benefit at 28 days, there was also significantly less barotrauma noted in the protective ventilation group. You may have noticed that this trial was not truly controlled in the sense that two variables were changed between the two groups. Subsequent trials have investigated whether the benefit seen here was due to the low tidal volumes or the high PEEP. Let's take a look at the most historically important of these trials. In 2000, the ARDSNET trial randomized 861 patients to a tidal volume of either 12 milliliters per kilogram or 6 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. Unlike the last trial, the PEEP in both groups was set according to identical, predefined tables. In other words, only one variable was being tested. Here is the primary outcome. The lower tidal volume group had higher rates of survival and hospital discharge. Here are some specific numbers. In the conventional ventilation group, 60.2% survived the discharge, while 69% did so in the lung protective ventilation group. The average number of ventilator-free days in the first four weeks was 10 in the conventional group and 12 in the protective group. Finally, the number of days without failure of a non-pulmonary organ was 12 in the conventional group and 15 in the protective group. This last result also highlights that ARDS and the subsequent ventilator-associated lung injury is a systemic disorder with consequences throughout the body. On the basis of the ARDSNET trial, lung protective ventilation has become standard of care for patients in ARDS. Unfortunately, there is not yet a single standardized protocol for delivering lung protective ventilation. One of the more variable aspects of these protocols is the method for selecting PEEP. PEEP can be selected using a published table of FiO2 and PEEP combinations to achieve an arterial oxygen tension or peripheral O2 saturation within the target range. This was what was done in the ARDSNET trial. PEEP can also be set at the highest value that allows the plateau pressure to remain under 30. The PEEP can be adjusted to provide the highest possible respiratory system compliance. And finally, PEEP can be set slightly higher than the lower inflection point on the pressure volume curve. There are probably additional methods with which I'm unfamiliar, and the theories behind each of these four options are beyond the scope of this lecture series. In practice, use of a published table is probably the most common method employed. Here is what such a table looks like. This is the specific one taken from the ARDSNET paper. For example, if a patient requires an FiO2 of 60% in order to maintain an oxygenation above an arbitrary target of 92%, the clinician would set the PEEP to 10 centimeters of water. One concept which is integral to lung protective ventilation is that of permissive hypercapnia. The first thing to realize about this is that permissive hypercapnia is itself not a strategy or goal per se, but rather a common consequence of alveolar ventilation in patients receiving lung protective ventilation. The arterial CO2 is allowed to climb through the resulting drop in arterial pH. There are no universal or well-defined thresholds which the patient's pCO2 and pH should be prohibited from exceeding. There are a number of important contraindications to permissive hypercapnia. Hypercapnia induces cerebral vasodilation, which may further increase intracranial pressure. Hypercapnia can induce systemic vasodilation, which may worsen hypotension. It may increase pulmonary vascular resistance, further worsening right ventricular dysfunction. And finally, a combined respiratory acidosis and severe metabolic acidosis may lead to an unacceptably low arterial pH, which can inhibit numerous processes at the cellular level. You may come across the term open lung ventilation while in the ICU, so it's important to know what this is referring to. In the most general sense, 
Open lung ventilation is a modification of lung protective ventilation that combines low tidal volumes to protect against volume trauma and high PEEP to protect against cyclic atelectasis. It may or may not also utilize recruitment maneuvers. Unfortunately, trials to date that have shown potential benefit have had serious methodological flaws, and therefore this is not currently considered standard practice for any group of patients. However, I suspect that in another 5 or 10 years, the evidence will be sufficient to recommend this strategy for a subset of patients with ARDS, specifically those with refractory hypoxia. I'm going to end this lecture by running through one protocol for ventilating patients in ARDS that utilizes the basic principles of lung protective ventilation. As mentioned before, there is no one standardized protocol, but they are all mostly quite similar. This particular one was taken from a 2011 article on respiratory care. For those interested, the specific citation is there at the bottom. Step one, choose a ventilation mode, typically either assist control or SIMV. Step two, start with a tidal volume of six milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. Step three, start with PEEP at greater than or equal to eight centimeters of water. Uh, step four, set the IDE ratio at one to two. Step five, measure and record the plateau pressure every four hours and after any changes in tidal volume or PEEP. If the plateau pressure is greater than 30, lower the tidal volume in one milliliter per kilogram increments until either the plateau pressure is equal to or less than 30 or until a minimum of four milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight is reached. If the tidal volume is less than six milliliters per kilogram and the plateau pressure is less than 25, increase the tidal volume by one milliliter per kilogram increments to a maximum of six. Adjust the respiratory rate or tidal volume according to pH goals. If the pH is less than 7.30, consider increasing the respiratory rate to as high as 35 breaths per minute while monitoring for the development of auto peep. If the pH is less than 7.15 and the respiratory rate is greater than or equal to 35 breaths per minute, consider increasing the tidal volume and suspending the plateau pressure limit. Step seven, adjust the IDE ratio to avoid auto peep and dyssynchrony. Uh, both auto peep and dyssynchrony will be discussed at a future lecture. Step eight, adjust the peep to maximize alveolar recruitment while avoiding over distension by increasing or decreasing PEEP in increments of two to three centimeters of water to a goal either that gives the best overall respiratory system compliance or according to tables of preferred PEEP for a particular FiO2, such as that shown earlier in this lecture. Finally, step nine, adjust the FiO2 to achieve an O2 sat of 88 to 95% or an arterial oxygen tension of 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury uh, with some room to adjust those goals depending upon the clinical situation. I hope you found this lecture on lung protective ventilation to be both interesting and useful. Please continue to lecture 10 on the physiologic consequences of mechanical ventilation.